So psychological egoism is a theory about what motivates our actions. And it makes this claim that all actions ultimately are traceable to the motivation of pursuing our own self-interest. So there's no such thing as actions that don't seek to maximize or promote our own self-interest. Now, that general theory also has a more specific version, and this very specific version has been influential in philosophy. For instance, many of the advocates of an ethical theory called utilitarianism were at least sympathetic to this view. So psychological egoism is going to differ from this very specific version called hedonistic psychological egoism precisely in the way that the name suggests. So psychological egoism specifies motivations in terms of a general notion of self-interest. Hedonistic psychological egoism specifies self-interest very carefully. It says that self-interest is promoting pleasure and avoiding pain. And so this latter theory, hedonistic psychological egoism, is going to claim that the only desire that ever ultimately motivates any human action is to get or to prolong pleasant experiences or to avoid or cut short unpleasant experiences for oneself. Right? So it's a much more specific view than general psychological egoism. It ties all of our motivations to pleasure and displeasure, or pleasure and pain. So hedonistic psychological egoism is all about feeling good and avoiding feeling bad. Psychological egoism is much less specific. It just ties all our motivations to self-interest. What about this ethical doctrine, ethical egoism? Well, ethical egoism is a theory about the choices people ought to make. It prescribes actions. It tells us how we ought to be regulating our moral and ethical behavior. And specifically what it claims is that for an action to be morally right, it must maximize that agent's perceived self-interest. So all actions that maximize an individual's perceived self-interest are actions that are deemed by ethical egoism to be morally right, morally good, morally praiseworthy. All actions that fail to promote an agent's perceived self-interest are deemed by ethical egoism to be morally wrong, blameworthy, or at least not morally um, permitted. And so ethical egoism is generally perceived to be a sort of radical view, though it has had a number of adherents throughout the years in both popular culture and even in, uh, to a certain degree in philosophy and ethics. Right? It's considered to be a revisionist view. It makes claims about how we ought to behave that run uh, contrary to the claims that are made by most ethical theories. So psychological egoism is then going to differ from ethical egoism because psychological egoism is really a theory about our psychology, while ethical egoism is a prescriptive or normative doctrine about how people ought to regulate their ethical and moral behavior, how people ought to go about determining what behaviors they should engage in. So ethical egoism is a normative or prescriptive theory. Psychological egoism is a descriptive psychological theory about what sort of motivations actually operate to generate actions in human beings. So psychological egoism is an observation, it's an empirical claim about human psychology. Ethical egoism is a normative or prescriptive doctrine, a claim about how we ought to behave, not how we in fact do behave. Psychological egoism also differs from another normative theory. This is the theory about rationality. And this theory has been influential in economics, for example. Right? And this theory is called rational egoism. And rational egoism is a theory that asserts that what it is to act rationally is always to act in a way that maximizes one's perceived self-interest. So it says, if I'm being rational, I have to act in accordance with that principle. 
It's not a claim about whether that's a good or a bad thing. It's a claim about whether I'm being rational or irrational. So it's prescriptive, but it's not prescriptive in an ethical or moral way. It's prescriptive by referencing rationality instead. Now, both rational legalism and ethical legalism, if we think about what the consequences of adopting those views would be like, one can think of ways of sort of spelling that out. So, for instance, if we go way back to 1982 and to Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan, there we find uh, Spock making a choice. Spock sacrifices himself to save the Enterprise. And Spock justifies that action by saying it's the greatest good for the greatest number. In other words, Spock is putting the good of the many above his own welfare. Now, if Spock were a rational or a ethical egoist, we'd have a completely different screenplay. We'd have a completely different character, really, because Spock would never do those things and he would say quite different things. So Spock might still say, live long and prosper, but he would then add, live long and prosper so long as you don't get in my way. And he would definitely not act in ways that promoted the greatest good for the greatest number. He would always act in ways that promoted his own perceived self-interest. So when the enterprise is about to blow up, Spock wouldn't sacrifice himself for everybody else. That's not in his own perceived self-interest. Instead, Spock might do something like uh, steal a shuttle and escape. That, is, that would allow him to continue living. That would maximize his self-interest, even if it didn't save the enterprise or anybody else on the enterprise. So rational egoism, ethical egoism, they are revisionist theories. They are theories that direct us to act in ways that seem inconsistent with people's perception of what's morally or ethically acceptable behavior. So in the next section, we'll look at arguments for psychological egoism, that psychological, empirical, descriptive doctrine about the motivations of human action. And we'll look at Rachel's evaluations of those arguments as well.